This week, Learning from the South, an African-American trans man shares his lessons from the Atlanta area, and two student activists from the Movement for Black Lives swap personal and political stories, one from South Africa, the other Chicago. That's all coming up next on The Laura Flanders Show. Well, so how do you like it? Lots of Americans awoke from the last election to get their first taste of non-representative government. Donald Trump lost the popular vote by almost three million votes, remember. The Electoral College unfairly privileges some states over others, we've been reminded. Worse in government now are people who oppose government. And they're set on reversing regulations, rolling back the social functions of the state to the detriment of the poor and the benefit of the powerful, especially corporations. It's all propped up by brutality and a fervent populism. None of any of this comes as a surprise to people in the U.S. South. Southern progressives, LGBTQ people, and people of color in the South especially have been living this reality for decades. Our guest today has some insight into what Southern resilience and action can look like in the age of Trump and what the rest of us have to learn from the South. Kazembe Murphy Jackson works with Black Lives Matter Atlanta and as the national organizer for the Freedom Road Socialist Organization, which for more than 30 years has been working across movements to end systemic oppression. Kazembe, welcome to the program. Glad to have you. Thank you. Thank so you. is that fair to say that you in the South woke up and sort of same old, same old? I think it's partly that's I think that's partly true. I think when we woke up and we realized that Trump was in office, part of it was like, OK, this is something that we've been dealing with. We call it the new Confederacy. We've been dealing with this kind of uh, action for a while. But also if there was a sense of urgency and responsibility that we were going to actually be called into action to lead other folks who were not in the South about how to deal with this same kind of administration. So when you talk about you've been dealing with some of these phenomena over the years, what do you mean? What, how do you describe it? I think uh, on a state level in particular, you know, we are used to really repressive um, kind of legislation. We have a lot of. Um, <clears throat> in particular in Tennessee and in Georgia, uh, Mississippi, we have uh, super majority uh, Republican um, legislatures that typically pass, you know, um, laws that are aggressive against queer and trans people, bathroom bills, that kind of stuff. Uh, in Tennessee, uh, you know, there were bills of things where they didn't even want students to be able to say the word gay in school. Um, but also against like, you know, living wages and uh, most states are right to work states. Uh, so we can't really form unions and stuff. Medicaid so, expansion. Exactly. <laughs> all of these kinds of all of these kind of things on a state level. And so we knew it would be a little different going to uh, a federal kind of level. But I don't know that any of us were actually prepared for the extent that that uh, of things that's happening right now. So how much patience do you have with northerners going, <laughs> oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh, panic, panic. You know, I think there is a level of patience um, because at the end of the day, in order for us to actually be successful in a resistance, we have got to kind of be open to folks who have different levels yeah. of experience with this kind of, of repression. Um, and so I think they're, they're, I, my, I'm learning to be more patient. Well, because, that's very kind yeah. of you. I think about it as a media problem in the sense that our media has so refused to cover the South that during the period of the Obama administration, the 2008 election, you would have thought everything in the whole country had gone Democratic. Right. Not so. Yeah, definitely not. Yeah, and so I, I agree with that. So being Southern kind of gives you an edge. Being a Southern progressive kind of gives you an edge. Being a queer, trans, LGBT activist of color gives you an edge looking into all of this. How so? And tell us a little bit about your life. I would be remiss to not add into that um, kind of uh, description also like a... a missionary Baptist. And so like kind of adding all of those things in, it's like I come out of a tradition of storytelling, testifying, kind of singing, um, and really building genuine relationships with people. And I think that is the thing that has really informed the way I organize, but also the way that we organize in the South. Even when we go back to thinking in like the civil rights movement. Like the reason, one of the reasons that the bus boycotts were able to be so successful is because people had built genuine relationships with one another so they knew who needed a ride. Now, go a little deeper into that. Is that a, <coughs> simply a strategic 
choice, a tactical choice, or is that really because your lives depend upon it? I think it's both. I think it's both. I think it, it def I think it is a, a it's a strategic choice in that how can I expect for you to resist especially as the repression gets more intense? How can I trust that you will actually fight for our interest if I don't actually know you? So strategically it makes sense. But then I think also it's very it's a very southern, it's a very black, it's a very baptist um thing to do to share meals to help raise our kids together, to help really get to know each other and spend time outside of our organizing work also, um, so that we just really have these mm. genuine relationships. And also in the trans and LGBT movement, the whole idea of coming out, that connecting with people, knowing people is how we do our politics or how we, how we emerge as full people. Yeah, especially when you, and when I think about the South, I live in Atlanta, but like I, I think about the smaller rural towns in the South um, in particular because isolation is a real thing when, when we talk about queer and trans folks in particular and Southerners on Newground uh, in the beginning was really good about um, making sure that queer and trans folks had a community. Tell us a little bit about how your gender identity has changed over time and how it relates or does it relate to your socialist identity? How does one inform the other? Yeah, I definitely think uh, that they're all <clears throat> related. And I think the part that is the most related is why it took so long for me to actually be brave enough to explore my, my gender. Um, I think that, you know, capitalism, patriarchy, all of these things have us lined up in these very uh, restricted boxes that make sense because it's easier to, to dominate people in these, in these boxes. Uh, for me, um, you know, I'm from Texas uh, and, I, you know, I lived most of my life as this tomboy wearing Doc Martens with dresses um, and driving my parents crazy uh, because they wanted me to pick a lane, which was, you know, get a perm, straighten your hair, wear nice dresses and, um, and a face full of makeup. And for sometimes I did. And so I've always kind of been at this intersection of boy and girl, man and woman. Um, and a lot of the times I call myself mixed gender. Uh, but it makes sense for people who don't have a deep understanding of gender identity for me to continue to identify as a trans man because they get it and they understand why my pronouns need to be he when I say trans man. But I think the identity for me when I first started to, I, for a long time I identified as a butch lesbian or what we say um, in the black community as a stud um, until, you know, 2010 or so is when I started <clears throat> really thinking Maybe there's something else to this because I'm not a I'm not butch. Uh, obviously, at the end of the day, I'm not. Um, but uh, for a minute, I thought, well, in order for me to be a man and for people to um, respect me as a man and to use my he pronouns, I need to denounce everything feminine yeah. about me, and I need to move as far away from women. And any time that anyone says she or her when they refer to me, I need to be extremely angry and and make them stop. And actually. I feel most free in this body that I'm in right now, um, understanding that there are some feminine parts uh, to me and I celebrate them. I think the future will be more fluid, you hope? I think it's already more <laughs> fluid. I think it's already more fluid. There are so many people who I know who won't pick one side or the other, the non-binary folks um, or gender non-conforming or whatever. I know so many people who are like, don't call me a woman, don't call me a man, call me a femme, call me masculine, call me this or that. So I just, I see it changing already. Yeah, I mean, I would really love to meet the people who love the binary. Right. <laughs> um, throughout their entire lifetimes. Exactly. It changes. All right, so the socialism, where did that come in and how does that relate? And tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing now. You've just come back from the UK. Sure. So I think socialism for me is about at the end of the day, I feel like I've, I've had a hard life, but at this end of it, um, I, am, I have access to a whole lot of privilege. Um, and, you know, I basically can eat and live and sleep and kind of move very freely. Um, you know, with the, I'm still black and trans, but, you know, obviously I can, I can move a lot freely than a lot of other people. And so I feel like my fight for socialism and the thing that is important to me is I want everyone to have access to that. Now, a lot of people watching this, you know, don't have a lot of clear models of what socialism is. Mm -hmm. um, and the models they have are models like Cuba or the Soviet Union, where I can hear them now saying, well, they were not nice to trans people, or it took mm -hmm. them a long time to get their head around uh, homophobia and the relationship between capitalism and, and homophobia. Mm -hmm. 
So when you say socialism, what are you thinking of? What do you mean? And is there a state expression of that any place? Yeah, I don't think that I don't think that 21st socialism in the United States is going to look like anything that's been done already. Um, I think that when I when I really think of socialism, I'm thinking of it as kind of like a vehicle to something else that's more permanent. And so I see us doing the things that are alternate to 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 like austerity. So like the idea for for us um, as Freedom Road and me even personally is more of we need folks, and I think we do take these examples from Cuba and Venezuela and other places, we need folks to actually understand what political moment we're in. Uh, and so it's about finding people, making sure that they are educating us and we're educating them so that we understand the climate and what needs to happen um, to shift it. And I think I see a lot of people doing that through um, what's been called like independent um, political organizations. Uh, and you see those kind of popping up everywhere, but it's really like these mass groups going out and finding people and then getting educated together and then electing our own folks to put in office and not in just a way where it's like, you know, find a progressive woman or a black face and put them in office, but like people who are actually coming up through those organizations, through the ranks with us, who share our politics, who are willing to fight mm. for us. I think about it a lot as sort of putting the social at the center as opposed to capital at the center. Right. Um, and what would we do if we organized the state on that basis? So we're running out of time. I haven't heard much about the British experience. Mm. Um, what did you take of what did you take away from that trip? And then I guess my last question would be for you to share some comments about what you think are priorities um, for people in this country right now. Sure. I think the the biggest thing that I took away was the different um, the different experience of what it is to be black in London and in the UK versus what it is to be black in the United States. How so? Black people in the UK, for one. I never really heard anyone say like, I'm black. I heard people say I'm Somali or I'm Jamaican or, you know, I'm whatever the name of their country or their, their parents' country was and kind of wearing it as like this badge of honor and really being connected to their culture uh, in a way that I feel like black Americans are connected, but we don't talk about it in the same way. Mm -hmm. In particular me, I know a lot of my time I, was spending before London talking about the black American experience based on the amount of oppression um, that I uh, receive. And I think being in London, but also traveling to and from with the U.S. passport really helped me understand how much privilege having that U.S. passport um, gives me and really being able to move freely while I watch so many other people get held up um, from being able to move. And so it really made me feel like my responsibility and the responsibility of other folks who are here in the U.S. Um, is also about making sure that we are current about what's happening everywhere else, but also being engaged in that fight to make sure that, like, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be different if I have a U.S. passport or if my passport is Syrian or if it's French or whatever. Um, we should all be able to move mm -hmm. freely. And what about the priority question, especially for people who perhaps aren't fortunate enough to, to live in the kind of community that you've described or haven't made that for themselves yet? I think two priorities. I think one, the biggest priority is resistance at this point. Like I think um, all kinds of resistance, it doesn't even, I'm, I'm just so proud of, of folks on the left and in general um, right now for the level of resistance that we've kept up since inauguration. And I think keep going, keep finding creative ways to resist this administration. But I think also we can't get caught up in just resisting. We also have to uh, be on the offense. So do I hear a book in the offing? Is that what I'm hearing? No, I don't have time for a book. <laughs> <laughs> but some people should write them. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's great talking you. with you. Um, you can find out more at our website, that's lauraflanders.com. Debates over priority setting and where issues of race, gender, class, and identity fit don't stop at the borders of the United States. Not long ago, I was invited to participate in a meeting in South Africa convened by the Transnational Institute and the Alternative Information and Development Center based in Cape Town. There I had a chance to get two student activists from the Global Movement for Black Lives to sit down for a conversation. 
The more Masera Maru and Jonai Strong talked, the more they found they had in common. Fights over rising university fees, for one thing. Maru was one of the leaders of the Fees Must Fall, Roads Must Fall campaigns at the University of Cape Town. It was against fee hikes and a statue celebrating Cecil Rhodes, prime minister of the colonial apartheid state. Strong works with BYP 100, the Black Youth Project in Chicago. If we want to go fundamentally, we're up against just the ability for black people, for marginalized oppressed people to self-determine. Basically, the right to be. Yeah. That's what I think mm -hmm. black people are fighting or being suppressed. Like, you know, the, the suppressions about and what they're fighting for is the right to to be. It's a very deep-rooted fight mm -hmm. um, and a deep-rooted oppression. I was involved in student activist spaces for the longest time, but um, mostly I think the height of my activism was during the Rhodes and Swole movement. Black students rallied around the cause for decolonization at the university. And this is after a black student at the university threw pool on the Cecil John Rose statue very big statue that sat on the university property for over 50 years. And so students started to have, I think that that particular moment was important because it's, many of us connected with it in a particular way, you know, um, and it inspired a conversation. And so days later, some of us decided just to start organizing around the idea of decolonizing and firstly removing the statue because I think it was a representation of everything mm -hmm. that was wrong in the university, you know. Mm -hmm. We were also calling into question the idea of this rainbow nation where everything and everyone seems to be living in peace, but so many people's lives had not changed. I think what Rose Miss Fall was doing was calling that into question that like also that black students on campus on campus and part of the university had to we're in a permanent state of an existential crisis mm. of of existing within the space and then getting out and then going back to poverty mm -hmm. and this double life we all had to live and also a double life that that required us to integrate you know in a particular way to assimilate because you will not exist without assimilation as i like hear the story that Masay is telling i just find so much similarity in america systems are able to compromise or come to a line to a point where we may think that mm -hmm. things are different but like the real lived actual um day-to-day -day for people is still the same mm -hmm. i started my activism um when i was in college I was a part of a university community where I knew that I was there because I was able to get into this university because they were affording like certain people to be there like on scholarship. And so I was like, okay, this is an opportunity for me to go to school, to get a good job, to get money and to like move my family up. And so there's this kind of like ethos of folks who are in a working class position that to be socially mobile is how you go into this strata mm -hmm. of success and then you bring it to your family. And then that's how we're gonna incrementally all kind of get on the same page. Mm -hmm. By the time I got to almost my last year in university was the killing of Trayvon Martin and then the acquittal of George Zimmerman. And I think myself, I was situated in this really interesting point in history where a lot of young like black millennials were understanding that there is no protection for us. We're gonna mm -hmm. have to self-determine, we're gonna have to figure out how to do this. Mm -hmm. And then we became a part of this longer legacy of like black self-determination. Um, and so it's been since that time that we've been trying to not only critique the state, um, but also learn how to provide alternatives. So I organized with Black Youth Project 100, which is under the, the larger Black Lives Matter movement. We're understanding that in terms of breaking down these social hierarchies, we have to be able to express those values in the way that we interact. Mm -hmm. so, so for the organization that I'm in, we have a very large emphasis on black queer leadership, black mm -hmm. queer leadership, gender, gender nonconforming, trans leadership. Um, and that when we talk about an issue, we're not just talking about it in terms of one particular group. One thing that BLM did across the nation is we did Say Her Name campaign. So there's this idea that whenever a black man is murdered, that we go into the streets, you know, we do the hashtag and we need to stop the brutalization of black men. Mm -hmm. But then also we have to understand the sexual violence, the sexual assault and the brutalizing of black women, them, gender nonconforming and trans folks as well. Liberation movements were kind of like a single, single issue movement. And mm -hmm. I think this is, there's now a clear refusal from our side in saying, 
he will not write out people from history. And the root of it is that this is not new in the sense of mm -hmm. the actual day to day of the movement. Movements have always been heralded by black oppressed, um, other otherwise oppressed feminine bodies, mm -hmm. but they have not been able to, as Masay said, be included in the history. This project of self-determination is important because it gives us an, an opportunity to break those things down, mm -hmm. recognize our part in perpetuating our own oppression mm -hmm. and doing better. It is breaking that Eurocentric mold that we've been formed in. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do it. I know other of us do it. We all kind of go into that mold because this is how we've been socialized. Mm -hmm. But if we can go back to a more authentic understanding of how we're connected to each other, how we're connected to the land, you know, mm -hmm. like that is the way in which we can find a path forward by going a little bit backwards. For me, it's important that we continue growing mm -hmm. and continue learning. For me, it's about the learning because I don't think growth happens without learning, or in the absence of learning. Um, and I think where we're headed is building more transnational, transnational yeah. links mm -hmm. um, and solidarity, strengthening transnational solidarity um, because the fight is getting bigger and uglier, <laughs> mm -hmm. bigger and uglier, and it's coming closer and closer and closer to all of us. Mm -hmm. And I think it's it would be silly for us to wait until it got to our doorsteps. I completely agree with Masse, and I'm grateful to be able to have these like international, transnational conversations to see what's similar and also see what's particular to our context and how we can build from that. I mean, I think the, the piece that I'm resonating with at this point in being in this work is how deeply personal revolution is. If it's not in your heart, if it's not in your home, then it's not going to go into these external things. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes because it's so deafening the outside external force of like the state or the systems or the government that we get focused there but i think i'm learning more and more that if i can't look in the mirror and see like the blemishes on my face and be able to work with those and understand how i can change those things then i'm not going to be able to have impact outside so i think our movement is needing a lot of healing a lot of truth a lot of discomfort so that we can grow, like growing pain, so that we can actually get to a revolutionary point. Pope Francis got into trouble last month when he compared European migrant and refugee camps to World War II concentration camps. As it is not my habit to defend popes or wade into Holocaust disputes, I won't. But I will say I had, in this one respect, a pope-like response to a movie I saw recently. The Zookeeper's Wife, directed by New Zealander Nikki Caro, depicts the real-life couple Antonina and Jan Zabinski, who used their zoo to conceal an elaborate scheme that rescued hundreds of Jews from the Warsaw Ghetto and eventual extermination in Nazi death camps. Directed by a woman adapted from a book by Diane Ackerman, The Zookeeper's Wife has gotten grief in some circles for sentimentality and for overemphasizing animal war victims at the expense of human ones. Personally, I appreciated the story of resistance. What I wanted to talk about, though, was the recognizability of that Warsaw Ghetto. As soon as the audience sees people in World War II clothing rounded up and herded into walled-off buildings to live in subhuman conditions, we all know what's going on. Even without special effects or gazillion dollar budgets, we know the Warsaw Ghetto reflects a genocidal plan to exterminate a people. So how do refugee camps read? And not just refugee camps. I was in the desperately poor suburb of a wealthy world city not long ago, where dark-skinned residents lived in tin roof shacks packed behind a dividing fence at the side of a major highway. Without running water or reliable electricity or effective garbage collection or real doors or windows, for lack of tolerable toilets, men and women and children broke through the fence to defecate in full view of high-class commuters driving to the airport. I've seen similar scenes on just about every continent. So how do those scenes read? Decades of movies have taught us that the Warsaw Ghetto reflects genocidal intentions on the part of the ghettoizers. Perhaps that's why World War II metaphors are perhaps overused. We know what they mean. So what about the subhuman conditions we systematically herd whole populations into 
through war, segregation, expulsion, redlining, detention, incarceration. What do today's ghettos and camps and slums reflect intention-wise while some stack up unimaginable riches? Quote, one of the greatest dangers we face, Pope Francis wrote long before he became Pope, is a feeling of complacency, of becoming desensitized to the world around us. Last I heard, he was defending his comparison, and I stand with him. Write to me, tell me what you think. That's Laura, L-A-U-R-A, at lauraflanders.com. And find all our archives at our website. That's lauraflanders.com. I hope you'll subscribe and contribute. Become a member. Join us. And thanks.